Hello everybody and welcome back to Handsome German, the only show on the internet. Completely skipping by Elden Ring because the time has passed. And, you know, you know Elden Ring is good. Uh, so instead, let me tell you about a wonderful little game that I've received an early access code for from the developer or publisher, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and that is Songs of Conquest, which promises to be a spiritual successor to the Heroes of Might and Magic adventure strategy game. Now, just real quick, I assume most of you are familiar with Heroes of Might and Magic, otherwise you wouldn't even know about this game's existence. But for those of you who ended up here without knowing what home is, let me just explain real quick what a adventure strategy game is. They are a series of turn-based semi-grand strategy games, if you will. Uh, basically, if you're familiar with the Total War series, imagine that, but the combat is also turn-based. And all of your armies are led by, in this case, wielders, who are basically generals that you can have a limited number of, who represent all the forces that they have with them on an overworld map and you move those armies around, you capture important ore mines and lumber mills uh, to obviously gain resources that you need to build buildings in your cities and to recruit new units that you gain access to via those new buildings. So if you build a crypt with the Loth faction, then that will start generating a supply of skeleton soldiers for you, who you can then recruit into your wielders' armies by paying certain amounts of gold for them. Now what's always been the most fun about these strategy games, about the Heroes of Might and Magic games, as opposed to other strategy games, is the titular heroes, which in this game are called wielders. And what's the most fun about it is that they level up, and every time they level up you get to choose between uh, upgrading an ability they already have, gaining a new ability, or increasing the size of the army that wielder can lead, which is a system that's entirely new to this game in Heroes of Might and Magic, there was a fixed number of units that every hero could have. Say, every hero can have seven different units or seven different troops in their army. In this game, it's actually a skill that you can level up. It starts at just three, which is a very, very small unit, but can still be useful depending on what you fill those three slots with, obviously. Now, skills that you gain uh, range from, oh, your destruction spells are stronger, your chaos spells are stronger, and you gain more chaos essence, which is this game's version of mana, to all of your ranged units deal 10% more damage, or all of your units receive 30% less damage from ranged attacks or gain additional retaliation strikes per turn. So that's all there. Everything that you like about Heroes 3 is there. Now, something that I do think needs work, and that's like my first bit of constructive criticism, is that these skills are very basic, and there's no sub-skills that spin off from them. Something that made Heroes 5 my personal favorite in terms of game mechanics is the combination that is the fact that certain combinations of skills will give you access to unique skills that are way wilder than what you'd expect. Like, for instance, if you have uh, the... I I'm just... <laughs> Like, say, I'm just gonna make something up. Uh, if you have the fire magic, like advanced fire magic, and also the advanced ballistics skills, 
then you can learn an ability that makes it so your ballista shoots fireballs instead of bolts. Something like that. Which Heroes 5 was full of. There were tons of these combinations that were incredibly powerful, but also very situational. Uh, one of my favorites is Death March, which makes it so all of your units gain 5 extra movement points while in a siege battle. There's one that makes it so Earthquake, which usually damages castle walls, also damages all enemies inside the castle. There were a lot of these really cool combination skills, and they are completely absent in Songs of Conquest, which is a shame. Uh, but I can also see why, considering that it would be really hard to come up with a lot of interesting skills, considering how few of them there actually are. I feel like every... because uh, for context, heroes are usually divided into which faction they belong to, which of the four factions they belong to, as well as whether they focus on physical combat, uh, making their units stronger, or if they focus on spell casting, which obviously can have a wide variety of different effects depending on the spell. And I feel like every single one of my might wielders in, in the Heroes games to divide it into might heroes and magic heroes. So I'm just going to apply the same thing here. So every single one of my might characters ended up with improved melee fighting, improved ranged fighting, improved uh, defense, improved positioning. And they, they just all ended up being exactly the same character. And same thing applies to magic users, even though there is one system that really sets this game apart that I'll get to later when I talk about combat a little bit more. So the skill system is unfortunately a little underwhelming. It's very reminiscent of the older Heroes games like 2 and 3, where the skills have one set purpose. You get logistics, okay, that means you can walk further. In this game it's called March, it means you can walk one or two extra steps every round on the overworld map, which is powerful. Being able to outrun or catch up to an enemy is really, really useful, but it also feels kind of like a waste of a level up if you could make your hero stronger. I definitely feel like a lot of these abilities need to have more effects than they do right now. There are some instances of that. For example, uh, me the melee skill uh, improves your melee damage by 10% and 20 and then 30. And when it increases by 30% on the highest level, it also gives 10% melee damage reduction, which makes sense. Your units are better at melee fighting, therefore they also take less damage melee fighting. Archery has a similar thing, plus 10, plus 20, plus 30%, and on the highest level it also increases the range of all of your ranged units by one. Which is cool, but I feel like some skills, like for example learning, which increases your experience gain, doesn't have anything like that. It just goes up to, okay, now you gain 50% more experience, which again is huge and very useful, but it doesn't have any extra effect, like making it so your character... I don't know. I don't know. There, it's very limited. In Heroes 5, Enlightenment, which was the same basic effect, also increased other attributes, which made it super powerful. In this game, I'm sure they wanted to avoid that specifically because they must have... Obviously, they played all of the Heroes games except for the last two. It, it, I, I would be very shocked if anyone on the team hadn't. And... I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to avoid that exact situation where enlightenment is just a must-have skill, where learning is just a skill that you have to have, otherwise your hero is not going to be able to compete at the later levels of a match. But something, you know? And it's difficult because of the way the spells work, I can't even say, oh, what if a hero with high learning gains extra spells, but spells work differently in this game so that it doesn't apply. So that's kind of a problem. I definitely think that skills need to be more interesting, need to have more effects than they do right now. Obviously it's hard to balance according to that, but I think in general uh, heroes don't gain enough additional strength over time. The most useful skill I found, especially in later game, is command, which 
you know, for every level up in command, you get one extra slot in your army. And I found that the most useful out of all of them because of the way the magic system. And the magic system was actually really interesting and I think mostly well done in that you start at zero essence. I'm just gonna call it mana. You start at zero mana at the beginning of every combat and whenever it's one of your units turn, that unit, depending on what kind of unit it is, has a kind of essence. And I think there's five different kinds. There's creation, destruction, chaos, order, and arcane. And depending on what kind of unit it is, for example, the shields of order give you, I think, three points of order mana, uh, which is really powerful. I think three is the most any unit can give you. And those are added to your total and they unlock spells that you can then cast. What's interesting about that is that all wielders know all spells that exist in the game. However, they'll only be able to cast them if they have enough units that give that appropriate mana to them, which is really interesting. It adds another layer of strategy to what units you actually want to bring. If you focus on destructive magic, you might want to sacrifice one of the slots that you were going to give to a higher level unit to a lower level unit that does provide destruction mana. So that's just a really neat system. What is a little weird is, like I said, the fact that all wielders know all spells, which means that a lot of the time you just kind of fly by the seat of your pants or whatever that expression is. You just kind of play for a round and then the next round starts and you're like, oh, I've never even seen that spell before because I just recruited some minstrels that I didn't have before. So let's just cast this spell and your wielder can just do that. And like I said, it's, it's a little weird thematically, but it definitely works. Another thing that's maybe a little broken right now is the fact that you can stockpile essence like crazy and then cast a bunch of spells in a row. Usually in Heroes of Might and Magic you have to wait a whole combat round or until your hero traveled all the way back to the front of the initiative tracker in Heroes 5 before you can cast another spell. In this game there is no restriction except how much essence you have, which to me just uh, always meant, okay, just play it slow, let the enemies come to you, and wait to have built up like 30 order, and then just buff everyone in my army like crazy, and then wreck everything in one turn. Which is fun, and not as feasible against a human opponent, because they'll probably see through you trying to do that, but it's also, it, it, it feels cheap. It feels like you're cheating, which I guess magic in strategy adventure games, adventure strategy games has always kind of felt like cheating. So maybe, maybe that's totally appropriate. I don't know, just an interesting system. I don't think it's better or worse. I do like that it completely removes the strategies of old where you would take a single fire unit with you and then cast Armageddon against enemies that obviously doesn't affect you, but completely wipes out the entire enemy army. And you can just do that over and over again. Because in other hero like in other games, like the Heroes of Might and Magic games, you would start with however many spell points you had when you entered the battle, and they carried over between battles. So I like that you can't rush people with just spells anymore. There's actually a larger emphasis on building an army and leading it because even a spellcaster is completely useless without a selection of units uh, under them. So that's definitely, that's definitely an improvement in that regard, for sure. Now, another thing that's different about this game is the fact that there's actually a limit to how large the stacks of units can be. Now again, if you're unfamiliar, the way multiple of the same unit are represented in these games is there's a single 
let's say, musketeer standing on the battlefield, and at the bottom it just says 20, which means that this one musketeer represents 20 musketeers in the game's world. And obviously, when those 20 musketeers attack, they will do 20 times the damage of a single musketeer. When they get attacked, some of them might die, the number goes down, and the unit gets weaker over time. And that's just kind of how these games work. It's a little weird at first, but you kind of get used to it after a while. Now, like I said, there's a limit to how large the stacks can actually be. In Heroes of Might and Magic, that I don't think was ever a thing. You could easily have 11,000 skeletons in a single pile just standing there and just nuking everything. Well, in this game, you can have up to 20 archers or five dragons or 10 horned fairy creatures uh, as a single unit, which in combination with the limited slots in your army means that you can't just dump an entire army onto an inexperienced wielder and expect them to do particularly well. What's uh, interesting about that is that it further emphasizes the importance of creating a balanced roster of heroes during the skirmish or during the campaign. Because otherwise, where in Heroes games you can just give someone, hey, here's a level one hero, give him 20 black dragons and they'll be the strongest hero in the entire map. Their army will be the strongest, they can kill anything. In this game you can't do that because that hero doesn't even have enough slots to bring that many dragons. So it creates this really nice dynamic where you will have one hero that is stronger than the others, but you still have to consistently move other smaller armies around to clean up things that are not worth the bigger hero's time while also giving them chances to gain more experience so that whether you are using them to fight smaller battles or whether you're using them to transfer you to carry units from your strongholds to your hero who's out in the field you're going to want to give them a chance to gain experience because otherwise someone who can only bring 50 militiamen, 20 archers, and 20 footmen. Sure, they can resupply your army, but if you level them up a couple times, they can suddenly bring six stacks of units to restore any losses that your main hero had. And I really like the system. I also like that there is uh, research to be done in the game. There are research options for in high-level buildings uh, where you can actually increase the size of stacks. You can make it so that instead of 20 archers you can suddenly have 30, which not only allows you to bring more units in that slot, but also makes them a lot stronger. So that's also a really interesting aspect, this idea of research, which was never in any of the Heroes of Might and Magic games. What's also interesting is that you lose access to those advances if the town that it was researched in gets captured or razed. Uh, haven't really talked much about how towns work. The way they work in this game is there's always going to be a set amount of a set number of small, medium, and large construction areas available. And obviously the larger the building is, the more expensive it is, the longer it takes to build, and the more important it is, potentially. So where a small building is something like a peasant hut where you can hire militia, then a medium building, something like a marketplace, which can be really important on certain maps, or the barracks where you can hire slightly higher level units, and then at the highest level, you can get Fey Elders, who are just these really powerful magic users who blast anything, pretty much anything, to just blow up whatever, <laughs> whatever they want, really. And also the Grand Armory or the Academy, where you can do research, where you can make improvements to your units, increase their resistances, their damage output, 
which is all really expensive. So it's mostly end end game stuff that you'll get to once all the necessary improvements have been made. Once you've built everything that you need. Now the settlements are divided into you have smaller settlements, larger settlements, and actual fortresses. Um, the bigger it is, the higher level it can become. You can spend a bunch of gold, uh, ore, and wood to upgrade them, which increases the number of army slots that you can have in there as a defensive unit. It also adds additional building spots to the map for you. And it's a, it's a neat system. It inc oh, also increases how much gold you get from that settlement every round. Uh, it's a neat system. I had to get used to it first. Uh, what's really weird, it feels a little jank, but I guess it works, is that at any time you can sell any of the buildings and get a full refund on it, which is nice considering that sometimes you will build a lumber mill and then 10 turns later, you find a lumber mill out in the wild and capture it. And then you realize that you actually need an ore, so you tear down the lumber mill and use the money to build a quarry instead. And I really hate selling buildings in this game. I, I just, I feel like I, I have to stick to the mistakes I made, which is really silly and definitely not how any competitive player would play. I'm... Definitely, absolutely a filthy casual when it comes to these Heroes of Might and Magic games. I've just always loved them and always played them with uh, my best friend and now with my wife. We just love those games. But I've, I've always been a bit of a casual, which is also why I can't really tell you how well balanced the combat is. Uh, at this point, I probably have already shown you some combat. I'm going to put some in the video right now. And it's fairly self-explanatory, I think. You just look at it and then I think you get it. You move your units around. Every combat round, every unit gets one turn. And most units don't have the ability to wait until later in the round, which is a big difference to the Heroes games where you could just wait, 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 wait. And then if you have two human players, you will just wait, 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 wait all day and night. And that was just no fun, so I'm glad they got rid of that, honestly. But yeah, like, if you look at the combat, you move a unit to another unit and you hit it, and it kills some of those guys, and then they retaliate, and then it might kill some of yours. Archers can shoot from further away. If they're on high ground, they have bigger range, deal more damage. If enemies are within the second dotted circle, they take regular damage. If they're within the closer of the two dotted circles, they take double damage, which is really powerful. And yeah, I mean, combat is very self-explanatory and what kinds of strategies are available to you will drastically change depending on your faction and which units you end up going with. My wife, for example, absolutely loves the rats of the cultist undead faction because you can put a hundred rats in a single stack and it will deal 500 points of damage, which is enough to kill 10 of anything, basically. It just, it's a lot, it's a lot of damage. Uh, something that I do really like and ma that makes the game more immediately crunchy and violent, if you will, uh, is the fact that you cannot surrender and you cannot retreat once you're in a battle. Which, on the one hand, can suck if you go into a battle against just a random group of enemies that are just standing there guarding a lumber mill or something. And it says, oh, it's between 10 and 25 archers or whatever. And then you're like, I can take 10 archers. And then you start the battle and it's 25 of them. And then they just kill you. And then, yeah, you have to pay to get your wielder revived and you have to restore the entire army, which is going to take many, many rounds of waiting to get slowly two or three units at a time back to where you were. But what's nice about it is that in the Heroes games, pretty much every time you encountered an enemy hero, 
they would just cast Lightning Bolt and then run away. Especially, obviously, if their army was way weaker than yours. They would just kill five of your archers and then run away. And that just always was really anticlimactic. It felt like you didn't get rewarded for catching up to an enemy. Like, sure, they lose their army, they have to pay to get their hero back, but you barely get any experience, you don't get any of their artifacts. So I really like the change that you cannot run away from a battle. I, I say that now until I show you that amazing battle at the end of the video where I get fucking destroyed by something that <laughs> that was supposed to be medium difficulty. And I guess it's the last thing to criticize about the game before I just tell you to go play it because it's the most fun I've had with a multiplayer game since Monster Jaunt, is the fact that you should not necessarily trust the difficulty assessment that the cats in front of the door give you. <laughs> the difficulty assessment, assessment, assessment that the game will give you. If it tells you something is easy or very easy, that's fine. That means this encounter is not a problem for you. If it says something is medium difficulty, it could mean that yes, you will win easily or you will die without killing a single enemy and all of your friends are dead. Goodbye. So that's something that can happen. Make sure you set the autosave frequency to 1, which means every turn, I think. So that if something like this happens, which can really, you know, ruin your campaign or really kill the mood when just casually playing hot seed multiplayer with someone important in your life. So you can just load back and be like, okay, this doesn't count. We're still learning the game. I don't want to be punished that harshly for underestimating the weird flail ghosts. So that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've already seen the game looks absolutely gorgeous. I really love that they went with pixel art. It's very nice and reminiscent of Heroes of Might and Magic 2, which is obviously, you know, the second... The, the, the other fan favorite, I imagine. Obviously Heroes 3, but, you know, that game is broken and weird. It's the melee of strategy games. Uh, the only other thing, I guess, to criticize is the music. It's a little underwhelming. Sometimes you get moments where the music perfectly matches up with, 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 perfectly matches up with what's going on. Those moments are awesome. I love those. But... Then again, most of the time, it just kind of blends into the background, which especially considering the game is called Songs of Conquest, it's a little disappointing. A little disappointing. I know that, you know, it's a small team. I... <laughs> I kind of wish they had gotten Paul Anthony Romero on this, the composer of Heroes of Might and Magic, because that guy is, like, the best. Like, for real. He's, like, better than Borislav Slavov, and I don't say that lightly. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, I mean, it's an early access right now. It's, it, it doesn't feel broken at all. It does lack content, especially in terms of maps and skirmish mode. I've played through the first of the two campaigns and it was uh, five levels long, I believe, which also, you know, not the most content ever. I don't think you're really missing out if you just wishlist the game and play it later, but if you absolutely want to relive the experience of learning a Heroes of Might and Magic game, if that's what you want, and it's an amazing feeling that, you know, my wife and I have been sharing for the last couple of days, uh, just go back to zero and what if Heroes of Might and Magic 6 had been good? You know, what if that game had been good and you're playing it for the first time and there's new factions and there's new units and there's new gameplay mechanics and new resources, new everything. It, it, it's a great feeling. It's fantastic. It's not just for nostalgia either. Like while I did grow up with these games, so I started playing them when I was fucking seven years old. Uh, my wife only got into them when we met, so... It was about eight years ago at this point. It's not just nostalgia for the old games. It's just raw, unadulterated quality. 
and I can't wait what's next for the game. I really hope something in the cards for the future are additional factions. I'm really glad that of the four factions that exist, uh, one of them is Swamp Frog People, because Fortress and Heroes 3 has always been my favorite faction in any video game ever. So I'm glad that there's the Rana, which funnily enough is just Spanish for frog. So here's your little fact out of the day. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that the frog people are in. That's, that's a good note to end it on. <laughs> yep, frog people are in. 10 out of 10. Well, let's, let's, uh, in early access in its current state, I'm not going to give it an out of 10 rating, but I've been having tons of fun with it, uh, both in single player and multiplayer. The content that exists is amazing. Uh, I'm sure, I have no doubt that fans are going to recreate a ton of old heroes maps in this game in the map editor. So you won't run out of quality stuff to play anytime soon. Yeah, uh, I strongly recommend if this looked interesting to you to either wishlist the game on Steam or if you can afford to drop $30, just do that and play the game and experience its evolution over time. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out in the end. I personally think it's already worth the money. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for watching and uh, make sure you check out in the description uh, Astroyale, my battle royale card game that I made that is on crowd sale on the Game Crafter right now, meaning it's a crowdfunding campaign except the game already exists and the more people back it, the cheaper it becomes for everyone. So get in on that too. And uh, again, thank you very much for listening or watching or reading the auto-generated subtitles. Yeah, I, I see you. You exist too. And uh, goodbye.